Welcome to episode two of how I create art in Blender. This video is going to be focusing on texturing and shading. Now I'm going to structure this slightly different to the last video. Instead of going through how I created each model individually, I'm going to be going through the different processes or techniques that I used to texture different parts of this model. I find with texturing, as in all things in 3D, it's good to have different tools in your tool belt. It's good to have different techniques to achieve the same look because some models are going to demand different things. In this, I'm going to be taking you through each technique that I used to texture different parts of this final model. And then you could use these to carry on to any project that you like. These aren't the only ways, but these are the ways that I used on this particular project. So I'm going to call this first category simple shaders. Now the reason I'm calling this category simple shaders is because these are models that are really not going to be in the foreground and can just have a very basic shader put on them. I usually just use the principled BSDF and then chuck some noise onto the roughness just to give it a bit of variation, maybe give it some bump. But beyond that I'm really doing nothing more just because I know that this model's not going to be in the foreground so therefore there's not any point in putting extra effort onto it. Some examples of me using this is the cups and also the wires that are used to hold up the wooden blocks. Here's a cool trick if you want lots of color variations but you don't want to make lots of shaders. What you can do is create a ramp, plug it into the base color, turn the ramp to constant, set some random colors along that ramp, and then plug the factor of the ramp into the object info node, specifically the random input. Now, every time you duplicate the object, it'll be a different color. Just a quick way to get some variation. Now, category number two. These are things that are going to be slightly closer, but don't need you to actually go in and UV them and then do hand-painted textures. This is a way I like to get pretty realistic textures without actually putting in a whole lot of effort. Now, let's get online and find a tileable material. You can find some purchased ones on Mega Scans, but there are also free alternatives like Texture Haven. So how do we implement this? I'm going to add an image texture, and then I'm going to connect it up to whatever I want. It can be the roughness or the color. I'm going to pick my texture and you can see once you've added it in it's got all this nasty stretching on it it looks disgusting well easy fix for that change over to box and then set the blend all the way up to the top last thing to make this work add a texture coordinates node and then connect it up to object and because of some magic i don't understand it just goddamn works like you didn't even need to uv it it's incredible i only figured this out recently but now i use it all the time now if you want to change it around you can add a mapping node and then add a value node, connect it up to the scale, and then just edit the value in order to make it bigger or smaller. Easy as that. I used this technique in order to create the back metal plating and several other objects in my scene. If you want to create layered materials like the one you see here, an easy way to do that is to use the same technique I just showed you, but instead this time layer multiple of those textures on top of each other. So what you can do is create an underlying mod material for example, and then you can put a painted material on top and then reveal that using a mask, a noise with a color ramp should do. This is a great way to create more visually interesting materials. It's very easy to misuse tileable materials because very quickly they become clear that they are tileable, and you want to avoid that. Using lots of materials layered on top of each other is a great way to do this. And now we're on to category number three. In category number three, I'm going to name Lazy UVing. Now what I mean by lazy UVing is I'm doing the bare minimum UVing in order to get the result that I want. For example, the sign out the front of the stall needed something to be on the sign. So I just grabbed that face, UV mapped that one face, and then went online and found a sign that I liked and then just scaled it in until I could fit it on top. Another place that I used this was the receipts. I just went online, found a bunch of photos of receipts, and then just UV mapped the entire object flat and then just chucked it over the top. It's as easy as that. You can add in some roughness or some bump or something if you want it to be a little bit more interesting, but I didn't even do that for most of them. Now that brings me to the fourth and final category. And this category is the one that everybody knows and loves. It's traditional UVing with traditional texture painting. Now I like to restrict this to the objects that I know are going to be absolutely pivotal to creating my scene. Everything else is off to the wayward, but these objects are the ones that I know that people are going to be focusing on. So with this, I do regular UVs, and then I bring it into a program like Substance Designer, but you can texture straight in Blender if you want. The only thing is that this is the most time consuming technique. 
every object has to be done individually and the textures that you make for them aren't really transferable to others unless they're duplicates of the object. So I would say really restrict this to the ones that you know that you have to do this for. And that's it. That's all of the methods that I use to texture this scene. So you could go through and texture every single one of these just using the methods that I described. Now, before I let you guys go, I just want to give you a few extra little bits and pieces that I find helpful while I'm texturing. And the first one would be pick a color palette. Seriously, this can actually be so helpful and it's very easy to overlook. I like to use, in combination with my reference imagery, a site called Adobe Color. The site gives you the ability to lay out different color palettes like a monochromatic or complementary, and it just does it for you and you don't need to eyeball it. Uh, I use it a lot, it's awesome. The second tip would be stick to a level of stylization. Are you going for realistic or are you going for cartoonish? You need to stick with one. Every now and then you can get away with combining the two. Uh, Pixar does a pretty good job of combining the two, especially with their later films. But overall, you want to pick a general level of stylization that you want to stick to. Otherwise, things will feel like they're out of place. So that completes the second part to the series. In the last part, I'll be going through the lighting, rendering, and perhaps a bit of the compositing. That's my favorite part of the process, the finishing off, all the legwork's done, so you can just have a lot of fun with it. So until then, I'll see you guys later, and I hope you enjoyed the video.